Erev Tov Chavrin, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. And friends, uh, this evening I'm looking at an article here on the Times of Israel. It says Assad and allies commit war crimes in Aleppo while U.S. stands idly by. The Obama administration is watching as the Russian-Syrian Iranian Axis commits an unprecedented massacre even by Middle Eastern standards. This is what's being reported by the Times of Israel here about what's going on in Syria. And of course, when it says the Axis, it's referring back to the very terminology that George Bush referred to Iran as the Axis of Evil. It says on Tuesday morning, Syrian, gov Syrian pro-government forces accompanied by thousands of Shiite militias began another ground operation in eastern Aleppo. Uh, as of Tuesday evening, the operation hadn't finished, but it was clear that the Syrian rebel forces were on the brink of defeat and the citizens of East Aleppo were facing a massacre, at least according to reports emerging from the area. Testimonies emerging from the uh, city since Monday detailed brutal atrocities being committed by the pro-government Syrian forces. Arabic news outlets such as Al Jazeera were broadcasting desperate crawls from the citizens who were trapped and crying out for help. Now, that's kind of interesting when I read this, and I'm very much uh, disturbed at the Times of Israel is actually reporting such propaganda as this. And unfortunately, I have to call it propaganda. I reached out to Vanessa Bealey uh, about this. Vanessa is actually in Aleppo. She's an independent journalist. And uh, in fact, when I uh, jumped on Vanessa's uh, Facebook page right here, uh, I had noticed that this here, and by the way, before I read to you what it states here, let me, let me kind of blow this up. I want you to be able to see this really well here on your screen. Um, uh, the photograph that's here. Now this photograph here has been taken that the Syrian army had actually rounded up these civilians uh, after the liberation of eastern Aleppo, which is kind of ironic because if you remember, we've already been sharing with you um, different videos of the jubilation and the celebration of the citizens of eastern Aleppo that are being freed there. In this report here, uh, Rami Jarara reports for, for, uh, for civilians who flee eastern Aleppo, this is where their fate lies, rounded up by Assad's forces and stripped of their dignity as though they were criminals for enduring all that they have for years. The Syrian regime cannot be trusted, and this is why many would rather die than fall into the feet of a dictator. All right, well, Vanessa Bealey, and I did, like I said, I contacted Vanessa just to get a, 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 some thoughts from her, is the, are these things really true? Now, not based on this. I'm ba basing my information from the Times of Israel. And, uh, of course, now, Vanessa wrote in here about Rami Jarara. He, she says here, you are a lying propaganda merchant. Where are you in Aleppo, she asked. Meet me and defend your lies in public on camera. Second, these photos are of your Nursa Front terrorists and associates who surrendered to the Syrian National Army. All right, so this is not the Syrian army, but al-Nusra that's actually lining these people up in here. So I asked Vanessa, is it really so what we're seeing coming out in, in the times of Israel? That the Assad and the Russian government, of course they mentioned the Iranians as well, that they're actually committing these atrocities. And she said, it is false, 100% false. And I know Vanessa's been back in Aleppo here for uh, several days now. She went into Damascus about a week or so ago, went up into Aleppo, and has been covering it uh, on a regular basis. I'm not actually sure exactly uh, where Vanessa lives. I think Vanessa is from France, uh, but uh, she is an independent journalist and has brought out tremendous evidence also that indicts the White Helmets uh, for the lying atrocities that they have done as well, but yet backed by millions of dollars by the West, including uh, the United States, the EU, and other, and, and Britain as well, that fund the White Helmets. Now, not just Vanessa Bealey, but uh, because I, you know, I do have a communication where I can get in touch with Vanessa, I reached out to her. But then I found where Ava Bartlett uh, here, she was, uh, she's another independent journalist. She was at the United Nations there on uh, uh, Syria, uh, speaking on Syria. And a journalist, uh, a Western journalist, asked the question here. I want you to be able to hear it. It is a very remarkable uh, question and a remarkable answer. Listen into this right here. 
what about the corporate media, the Western media, the lies, uh, and all of this? Uh, could you explain what you think might be the agenda from us in the uh, Western media, and why we should lie, why the uh, international organizations on the ground should lie, why we shouldn't believe all these uh, absolutely documentable uh, facts that we see from the ground, these hospitals being bombed, these civilians who are talking about the atrocities that they have been experiencing. Um, how can you justify calling all of us liars? Now, I do, I appreciate his, his question as well as a journalist, and um, I realize, and the way she's going to respond to him, I think is sufficient within itself. Um, but there again, he has clearly identified himself as part of the Western journalist. And no doubt, he may be very honest himself. Uh, but the thing is, is she's going to correct the issue about the, the uh, as he says there, they have uh, credible uh, evidence and, and, and witnesses on the ground that are saying these things are true. Watch your answer and how he responds. Thank you. Um, I mean, there are certainly honest journalists amongst the very... Um, compromised establishment media. Let's start with your second question. So international organizations on the ground. Tell me which ones are on the ground in Eastern Aleppo. Yeah, okay, I'll tell you, there are none. Now, if you noticed, she gave him time to answer. He has no answer. And like she said, there are none. What she's going to state next, I didn't even know, and it really blew me away. Watch what she talks about. And this is what, by the way, John Kirby at the State Department, when he challenges uh, 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 Miss uh, Gayan, the RT reporter there, saying that they had trusted sources on the ground, and that no, they didn't have independent witness of it, but they had trusted sources. John Kirby actually quotes from this organization. Watch what she has to say about it, Miss Ava here. There are none. These organizations are relying on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in Coventry, UK, which is one man. They're relying on compromised groups like um, the White Helmets, which let's let's talk about the White Helmets. The White Helmets were funded were founded in 2013 by a British ex-military officer. They have been fa uh, funded to the tune of 100 million dollars by the US, UK, and Europe and other states. They purport to be rescuing civilians in eastern Aleppo and Idlib, yet no one in eastern Aleppo has heard of them. And I say no one, bearing in mind that now 95% of these areas of eastern Aleppo are liberated. The White Helmets purport to be neutral, yet they can be found um, carrying guns and standing in the dead bodies of Syrian soldiers. And uh, their video footage actually contains uh, children that have been recycled in different reports. So you can find a girl named Aya who turns up in a report in month, say, August, and she turns up in the next month in two different locations. So they are not credible. The SOHR is not credible. Unnamed activists are not credible. Once or twice, maybe, but every time, not credible. So your sources on the ground, you don't have them. Um, as for your agenda, not your, but the agenda of some corporate media, it is the agenda of regime change. How can the New York Times, I was reading it this morning, or how can Democracy Now!, which I was reading the other day, maintain until this day that this is a civil war in Syria? How can they maintain until this day that, there were un that the protests were unarmed and nonviolent until, say, 2012? That is absolutely not true. How can they maintain that the Syrian government is attacking civilians in Aleppo when every person that's coming out of these areas occupied by terrorists is saying the opposite? You talk about the... Exactly. I think it's case closed when it comes to that. And uh, of course, like I said, we, you know, we have uh, our own source there with uh, Vanessa being able to find out some of the information as it comes out. Vanessa also writes for uh, Century 21 Wire. You can find her on Facebook. Definitely look her up. Look at her incredible uh, reports that she does there. Just a marvelous journalist. And uh, Ava uh, Bartlett as well. Uh, just have my uh, hat off to her. Incredible uh, journalist herself there. Um, in fact, if you're on Twitter there, a friend of mine just recommended recently, Partisan uh, Girl. Uh, and from what I understand, she actually lives in Syria as well. And you're able to get a lot more information there about things that are going on. In fact, uh, just to share with you here, Aleppo rejoices after the Syrian Arab army liberates the city in, uh, in, the, in East Aleppo. 
So again, just to show you, this is the citizens of East Aleppo, and it doesn't look like to me that these people here are all upset over the Syrian army. So again, I, I'm just very disturbed that the Times of Israel has reported what they did. Uh, you know, b being Jewish myself, I, I understand. I said Jewish by birth, not by uh, by by religion, but I, I understand that the Times of Israel. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fear with Israel and the Iranian uh, mil uh, the Iranian country and and the regime there. Uh, but I think that things could be peacefully worked out. Everything does not have to be a military solution. Uh, and, but there again, I know that there has been a lot of threats, uh, especially from the Iranian side, not wiping out Tel Aviv, etc., etc. But when it comes to President Bashar al-Assad, we have not had these threats. And yet Israel it recently has attacked uh, the Syrian army uh, on several occasions here in the, in the last few weeks there. So it is disturbing uh, for me to see this. And I'm very much concerned that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu may be under the pressure of the United States in carrying out some of the acts that they're doing and, in, and even allowing uh, such propaganda to be, to be spread at, at the rate that it's being spread at this particular point here. Uh, moving on to other news here, I wanted to go back into DNA just a little bit and about the microchip there, mainly because of uh, a friend of mine there in Holland that shared this German report here. Uh, I actually hit the uh, translate button on here so I could uh, share this with you. Uh, but the, uh, the article here, Expert Secret Services Get Too Much Power by a New Law. This is a, a law just passed in Holland here. It's very disturbing. Uh, it says, a law which this week uh, is spoken in Parliament, giving the Secret Services very much power without there being sufficient independence monitoring in return. That writing, 29 terrorism and privacy experts in a letter to Parliament, the law gives the Secret Services, including wide powers to tap internet connections. It goes a lot further than that, even to the point where they're talking about implanting some types of devices that they can hear everything that the terrorists are doing. Now, what does that come down to? We're talking about microchipping, even at a point here where it speaks about the DNA itself. It says, think of the analysis of DNA, maybe someone with a particular gene or more likely a terrorist, it says uh, Van Yeek, or think of secretly installing a listening device in one's body. I mean, that's how serious these things are getting. Now, if they're thinking about this in Holland, imagine what's going on in other parts of the world with the RFID chip, etc. All right, now, but I did want to share something else. I mentioned to you in the broadcast that we released here on Israeli News Live last night about DNA and how that the Lord God just revealed to me that our DNA actually records, uh, uh, you know, every, every sound we make. I really believe that it does. I believe that the memories, etc., are stored there in our DNA. Well, I got several emails from friends out there that listen to that, sharing with me different things, and a, a sister named Tammy uh, shared uh, two different articles I wanted to share with you. Of course, this one here on the Medical Daily, Can an Organ Transplant Change a Recipient's Personality? Cell Memory Theory Affirms Yes. Now, here's what's really interesting, was this article that I got from her here, Cellular Memory and Organ Transplants. And just to kind of sum it up a little bit, they go into the evidence of uh, 23 different heart transplants uh, that actually have experienced the memories of their donors. And I thought the most provocative was the one here. And again, I'll blow this up on the screen here. Hopefully you'll be able to see this a little bit better here because it is a very light colored print. An eight-year-old girl who received the heart of a murdered 10-year-old girl began having vivid and reoccurring nightmares about the murder. The detailed descriptions of the murderer given by the recipient to the police were used to find and convict the man who had murdered the donor. The time, the weapon, the place, the clothes he wore, what the little girl he killed had said to him, everything the little heart transplant recipient reported was completely accurate. While such claims may appear to be outlandish, there may be reasonable explanation for them. Um, another one here says, while proposing the presence of a cellular memory, Gary Schwartz has documented the, the or, I'm sorry, that's just where Gary Schwartz actually spoke, spoke about it. Out of the uh, 74 patients, 23 of them who are the heart transplants recipients, these patients are reported to have acquired some traits of their donors. Uh, another one that was really interesting was... Uh, Another young man came out of his transplant surgery and said to his mother, everything is copacetic. 
It was later discovered that the word had been a signal used by the donor and his wife whenever they had made up following an argument. The last argument just before the donor's fatal accident had not been settled. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Then the 47-year-old Caucasian male who received the heart from an African-American teenager was reported to have acquired a taste for classical music. The donor had been an avid violin player. In another case, William Sheradian, retired a catering manager with a poor drawing skills, suddenly developed artistic talents after a heart transplant operation. He discovered that the man who donated his new heart had been a keen artist. I just think it's kind of interesting seeing these things here as far as just that, the, 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 the amazing things that are actually encoded on our DNA. So I think that the 90% of our DNA is not junk DNA. And I think what they're wanting to do is to suppress that DNA and microchipping will give them that advantage. Not just that, we're going to be going back. I'm going to get back again with... Uh, now, the man that my wife uh, interviewed, Henry, he's a, uh, uh, Harold, actually, I apologize, who is a scientist there in uh, Berlin, Germany, that sat down with Jana not long ago. In fact, we'll probably air that interview here on Israeli News Live as well. Fascinating uh, interview about chemtrails and how they are affecting us. But it's also said that chemtrails are being placed in the atmosphere because of the metals that it releases in the atmosphere to stop the wave. There's some kind of a, a, a light wave that actually is said that could actually wake up our DNA that is dormant. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.